reach across time and see yourself. You stand tall against terrifying enemies. You build masterpieces and break down barriers. You rush into the future and meet your past. For every time, at every moment, the official network of every millennium. The History Channel, where the past comes alive. They work in a realm devoid of light, in miles of cloistered tunnels deep beneath the ground. They use high-tech monster-sized equipment that can literally rip the guts out of a mountain. For hundreds of years, they have faced the potential for tragedy. One mistake could mean the difference between life and death. Miners, next on Suicide Mission. feet below the Nevada desert, all hell is about to break loose. Explosives experts at the Newmont gold mine are preparing to pulverize a 16-foot wall of rock. Embedded somewhere in the tons of stone are millions of fine particles of gold, the stuff dreams are made of. He's nearly completed the drilling. The red uh, spots around the holes or to identify the holes to be loaded when the, when the explosives crew comes in and loads the holes, we'll blast it immediately and then come in with our, uh, our ground support set up. The miners use ANFO, short for ammonia nitrate and fuel oil. The same explosive used by Timothy McVeigh to blow up the federal building in Oklahoma City back in 1995. It's risky business, especially since this high-level demolition work is done nearly a mile beneath the Earth's surface. Once the charges are set, Clear, okay. the fuse is lit. The miners make their way to an adjoining tunnel a thousand feet away. The History Channel's cameras were left rolling at the spot where the charges were placed. For the first time, miners and viewers are able to see what happens when the explosives go off. A gravel mist rains for five minutes. It's all in a day's work in the life of a miner, a world that has always been filled with extreme hazards. Their dangerous work has kept the nation's power plants stoked with coal and jewelry stores filled with gold and diamonds. But for the miners and their families, the natural resources they pull from the ground have been paid for in blood finding bodies, spraying them down with formaldehyde, placing them in odor-proof bags, putting them on a the stretcher, and carrying them back to the fresh air base where they were transported to the surface. You never forget it. To do their job, Miners face multiple risks. Explosive gases can ignite with a simple spark, or a mine's roof can cave in without warning, trapping a miner behind tons of rock. When tragedy strikes, finding a trapped miner quickly can be the difference between walking out of a mine alive or being carried out in a body bag. Conditions in coal mines can change hourly. A mine can be an entirely safe mine today and completely unsafe tomorrow. 
to give you an idea of the force of these explosions, it just pulverizes everything. And if uh, humans are in the way of these forces, it's unbelievable what it does to them. I've grown up with some of them. We went to high school together. Uh, they were all uh, friends of mine, and they, the crew that I would have been with, they were all killed there right at the mouth of that section. I got so scared to throw up. Uh, there were men older, much older than I, in their 40s and 50s, that threw up that day from fright because it's, it's like standing in a shotgun barrel when somebody pulls the trigger. You either walk out or you get blowed out, one or two. What remains constant is the proud belief miners have that the country was built because of their willingness to risk their lives to pull resources from the ground. In the past century, more than 200,000 miners have died in the United States in accidents or from mining-related diseases. Almost everyone I know can tell you the same story that I'm telling you now. I've lost a cousin in the 70s who was 30 years old, got killed in the mines. For thousands of years, men have gone into underground mines to retrieve natural resources, everything from coal to gold to salt and uranium. Mining for industrial purposes began in the early 18th century. The first coal mine in America opened in Virginia in 1750. Coal, compressed carbon, was used to fire the world's furnaces. By the early 19th century, coal mining had become a major industry. The largest deposit of coal in the world was discovered in the eastern United States, the Pittsburgh Sea. The eight-foot-thick layer of coal stretches for thousands of square miles under the states of Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio. By 1850, more than half of all coal used in the United States came from this region. It is uh, arguably the most valuable mineral deposit ever discovered on Earth. Uh, it's been mined for hundreds of years, and it's still being mined today. Not surprisingly, early methods of mining were very simple. Miners would dig into a section of coal using the room and pillar method. A room of coal was carved out by hand, with miners leaving large pillars of coal standing to support the roof overhead. The uh, room and pillar method means uh, just exactly, it's, a, it's exactly what it sounds like. The pillars support the roof, the rooms are, are, are created, the rooms are created in the coal. The rooms weren't uniform, of course, but they were where the coal was mined out. The pillars were left to support the roof. As the mining industry rapidly expanded at the turn of the 20th century, so did the risks of explosions, fire, and cave-ins, and the abuses of workers who were mainly immigrants. Laborers, the biggest expense in mining, were treated as second-class citizens by mine owners who put profits before personnel. Coal operators would tell the miners, don't you put that mule under any bad top. And the miner would respond, well, well, what about me? What about me under this bad top? And the boss would say, uh, we can hire another man, but we have to pay for that mule. Coal miners lived in company houses and company towns, went to the company store, sometimes never uh, received a paycheck because they were paid in company scrip. Uh, they were pretty much slaves uh, by and large. The number of dead in early mine tragedies was staggering. The list of mining disasters, which occurred nearly every week, were as commonplace as the street lamps that coal kept burning. The month of December 1907 was a typical 30 days of death. 
December 6th, Monaga, West Virginia. 362 die in an explosion. December 16th, an explosion and fire kills 57 at a mine in Yoland, Alabama. December 19th, Dar Mine in Jacobs Creek, Pennsylvania. 239 die after a fire. Out west, gold miners in California, Nevada, and Utah face similar dangers that were just as deadly. Many of the small mines that bored into hillsides were confusing mazes with shoddy construction that constantly had cave-ins. Inadequate ventilation and light would disorient and often choke a miner to death. It was just the beginning of a trail of tears for miners and their families, one that would last for the next 100 years. As the nation's need for resources expanded, so did the demand for men to mine underground, and so did the risks. darkness of the federal number two coal mine near Fairmont, West Virginia. One of the world's most powerful machines is put through its paces. It's called a long wall mining machine. Its steel teeth chew a path through coal three feet deep and eight feet high. Each path along the bed of coal that the long wall machine makes is more than 1,000 feet long. These machines can do the work once done by hundreds of men. This is a, uh, a working face of the mine. It was mined by a continuous mining machine, uh, which has a, a cutting head that just rips away at the coal. It takes the coal from the face, it's loaded out of the back of the machine, and then hauled out of the mine, either by a conveyor belt or by shuttle cars. The long wall machine is operated by remote control. The operator, wearing face protection, uses a handheld radio pack to signal the machine to move faster or slower. As the long wall machine passes, heavy duty reinforced plates of steel are moved in to hold up the mine ceiling. As the, the shear mines by and cuts the coal, you have to pull the shields in and it's all done manually. And uh, as, it, as, as the shear goes by, you drop them, pull them, then run them back up. And that hold supports the top. This is the heart of their coal mine right here on this long wall. This is what it's all about. Mining is a hazardous job. You're interfacing with an unengineered space or a not totally engineered space. Um, and so what, what has happened over the years is that we've gone further and further to engineering this space and better understanding how this rock over our head behaves, how the floor behaves under our feet, because in the very deep mines, the floor can come up just as well as the roof come down. So if you look at a modern coal mine today, everything is engineered, choreographed very carefully. These machines are worth millions and millions of dollars. Each minute is worth thousands of dollars. And so it's more like uh, a space mission. You choreograph it. You don't waste effort. You don't waste space or time. It's the fear of cave-ins, the ceiling literally crashing in from above, that remains the most real fear for miners. To keep the rock from collapsing, miners use bolts corrugated steel bars driven upward to reinforce the mine ceiling. This piece of equipment is called a roof boulder, and this is the kind of equipment that we use in the mines nowadays to uh, support the roof. And the reason it's used is because uh, probably the biggest hazard that coal miners face is um, underground roof falls. 
uh, if you go back through history and even till today, about uh, almost half of miners who were killed underground are killed by roof falls. Early in the 20th century, when coal mines peppered the Allegheny countryside, miners would try anything to support the roof over their heads. The most common technique was to erect wooden beams. Miners believed the wood could hold back tons of rock. But if a mine collapsed, the beams would often snap like toothpicks. Up until the 1930s, miners would use open flame headlamps to light their way. It was an effective way of providing light, but there was a trade-off an often deadly one. Coal mines are breeding grounds for highly explosive gases, especially the odorless, naturally occurring methane. If a miner walked into an area thick with methane, a day's work would turn into a fiery nightmare. It was during this time that the famous canary in a coal mine technique was developed. Miners would take canaries with them to work. The bird's small size made them more susceptible to poisons in the air. Miners used the birds to judge whether a section of tunnel was safe. The one complication is that there were strong canaries and weak canaries. You did not want to go into a mine with a strong canary because he'd keep breathing as, just as well as you would and he wouldn't tell you that there was trouble. You wanted a weak canary that would start staggering and finally passing out. And when you saw that, then you had to get out of the mine or get out of that area of the mine. Today, the fear of methane still hangs heavy in the air, though canaries have been replaced by high-tech monitoring equipment. Uh, this is a multi-purpose detector. Uh, this detector will tell me what the quantity of methane is in this area. It will tell me what the oxygen content is in this area, and it will tell me what the uh, CO reading would be in this area. Generally, the major source of methane in the mine is from the actual mining face because we're exposing new coal and the methane gas is being released by the exposure of that new coal. It's also the location where you have the most likely source of ignition because you have cutting bits cutting into the coal. If those bits hit a piece of rock in the coal or a rock binder, they can cause a spark. That would be a source of ignition. Coal dust itself. Uh made very fine by the small explosions that freed the coal to be loaded in, and uh, taken out of the mine. If it was fine enough and it was dispersed in the air enough, that could ignite. Coal dust can cause a more insidious problem, a long-term silent killer called black lung, a medical condition that still plagues miners today. That's coal dust. That's what ends up in miners' lungs. If you're fortunate enough not to be injured or killed during your career, what would eventually happen is you'd get sick and, and choke to death. Knowing that a buildup of gas and dust can be fatal, miners are always concerned with having a constant supply of fresh air. In this maze of coal line tunnels, Air is a commodity that's measured by the cubic foot. It's a concern that's been around since mines began. Now, this is called an anemometer. And uh, the supervisor would uh, take this anemometer and you would traverse this area for one minute. And by traversing the area, you uh, get a pretty good feel for the amount of air that's coming through here. Then after a one minute, um, examination, you get a reading on the dial that tells you what the uh, velocity is. You measure that by the width and the height of the area, and that will give you cubic feet per minute. So on the long wall, uh, we're required to have a minimum of 42,000 uh, cubic feet a minute coming on the face, and today we'll probably have about 70,000. 
every day you go to work, you don't think about the hazardous or nothing, you know. If you did, you'd probably worry yourself to death. <laughs> Many miners say the dangers that come with the job are worth the risk. Coal mining is a, is a, a well-paid profession, but it's also a, a dangerous profession and it's a hard profession. Today, a miner can make $60,000 or more a year. When I graduated from college, um, Raytheon offered me uh, it was something like $600 a month to work on the Patriot missile. Uh, Republic still offered me $1,000 a month to become a maintenance foreman in the coal mine. And, you know, that's one level of how good of a living you can make as a miner. And if what's being mined is a material as precious as gold, a day's work can be worth a king's ransom. The massive Newmont Gold Mine is a wonder to behold. Every day, a million dollars in gold comes out of this mine. There's the above-ground strip mining operation, and miles of underground tunnels, which operate like a small city. They generate their own electricity. They create compressed air for their equipment. And they run pumps that ensure underground water is quickly removed from the mine. When Deep Star was first uh, designed, there was fears that we'd have massive amounts of water. So we have two, two different uh, setups here of pumps, each capable of pumping 1,000 gallons a minute, vertically some 800 feet. Fortunately for us, we didn't get as much water as, as was anticipated. Fresh air is sucked into the mine by huge fans that create a vacuum effect. In a main entry like this one, a 10 mile per hour breeze constantly blows toward the work areas underground. Repairs to the massive mining equipment can be made without going above ground. There is a service station 2,000 feet below the surface. For some of these men, darkness is the only world they know. It is not uncommon to enter the mine before dawn, work a 12-hour shift, and leave after dusk. For them, the world is non-stop darkness. Miners recognize the dangers inherent in this kind of work, both underground and at the above-ground strip mining operation. A strip mine can be more cost-effective than boring holes underground, but it is still dangerous work. We try to keep a qualified emergency response team on site at all times. Right now we have 10 people per shift, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, the guys are certified firefighters. Anytime that we have somebody injured or trapped, uh, our guys are more than qualified to, to go in and take care of that problem. Say we believe everyone's out of, out of the, the scene right now, but you need to make a, need to make a check. Okay. Okay. Strip miners use massive equipment to dig into the earth's surface in order to get to precious rock. It takes qualified individuals to be able to, to work this job. That, that's a big part of the safety of this operation. Keeping these guys well informed of the equipment they're on, what its capabilities are, what its limitations are. We know that this equipment is big and we deal with it as, as that. Uh, we don't, don't ever take it for granted. That's when it'll bite you. Concern for safety is everywhere. Before anyone can enter a mine, they must be identified. Everyone entering the mine, both miner and visitor, is given two identical brass tags. It's a tradition that has been going on in mining for more than 100 years. 
One tag is kept in the pocket. The other is placed on a board outside the mine entrance. If disaster strikes underground, the above ground foreman knows exactly who is in the mine. Miners call it putting their brass on the board. Every person entering any mine must carry several standard pieces of equipment. A miner's hard hat with light and battery. And a self-contained self-rescuer, a device that has been used to get miners through pockets of bad air for the last 30 years. This is the uh, W65 self-rescuer, and the whole purpose of this is, is to get a person out of the mine in a disaster situation. Okay, so let's go through this. You have this in your mouth, and it starts getting warm. You don't want to pull it out because you know you're going through layers of carbon monoxide. If it gets hot, you still keep it in your mouth because the level of carbon monoxide is getting greater. In fact, these things here, they can get so hot that they can burn and blister your lips. You know, and when you're going through an area like that, you're definitely going through carbon monoxide, and this thing right here would be saving your life. If there is a disaster underground and the main roadway is blocked, there's another way out. This is a, what we call the secondary escapeway. This is a series of vertical raises uh, that go from level to level with ladderways in them, where they actually can climb up. It goes some 70 feet between levels. If you're going out of the mine if, on foot, it's faster to, to use these than walking up the decline. The end of the line comes at the mine's processing facilities. All the rock from both the underground and strip mines will be brought here. We handle uh, cyanide. We work with uh, sulfuric acids, uh, sulfur dioxide. Um, as part of the process. And our guys are very confident in working with that stuff. We, we provide all kinds of training to deal with, uh, you know, what they're working with out there. In a few hours, piles of worthless stones will be transformed into a small fortune. It's dangerous work. There's crushing equipment, noxious fumes, superheated metals, and deadly chemicals. In our acid room, we have to wear rubber clothing just so they don't get splashed with acid. And then while melting in the melt furnace room, we have to wear their protective silver suits so they don't get splashed. In the mine's refinery, molten gold is cast into bricks, valued at $1 million each. It's a bounty paid for with the sweat of miners who risk their lives to make a living. But sometimes, even the best paying job comes at too high a price. We still have a hope that they may be alive, although I cannot be optimistic. Life in the sleepy town of Farmington, West Virginia, revolves around the business of coal mining. The town was very close knit. People knew everybody else's business. It's one of them type towns, you know, and they, uh, and they pulled together if something happened. It's an area steeped in coal mining tradition and tragedy. In 1968, most men in town worked at Farmington Number no. 9, nine miles of coal mine that opened in 1909. Though it was known as a gassy mine, meaning number nine had high levels of methane, miners believed modern monitoring equipment would protect them. Things went along smoothly. The mine seemed to be going pretty good. And, and of course, my experience at that time was limited, and I felt that uh, still today, to this day, I feel that was the nicest mine I've ever in, appearance-wise. Danny Kuhn had come back from the war in Vietnam looking for a new life in his hometown. My father was very upset about me uh, going to coal mines, but I came back from the service and to maintain a, a, a livelihood in this area at that time was the only thing really going on was coal mine. Sarah Lee Kosnowski's husband, Pete, had been a miner for 45 years. Much of that time was spent in number nine. 
On Saturday nights, the couple would celebrate the end of Pete's work week by going out dancing. Boy, could he dance. Just every dance, polka and jitterbug and all them good dances. And that was an outlet for us, you know. On November 19, 1968, Pete got ready for work as usual. I said, good night, Pete. Be careful. I love you. I ran to the den. I looked out the window. I watched his car go clear out of sight. Only to never see him again. That was sad. Gary Martin was also an experienced miner. He had worked at number nine for four years on the midnight shift. Coal miners are tough breed of men. But you'll find that most underground coal miners are given a, a very, very tough situation and will react favorably. They know that they're fighting for their life. That fight for survival was called upon like never before on November 20th, 1968 at 538 in the morning. With 119 men close to wrapping their shift, something went terribly wrong. My uncle, he worked there also, and he was driving through the parking lot when the mine exploded right in front of him. It came right up the shaft, and there was a lot of devastation outside. It completely tore the head frame, the head house off, the fan, uh, burnt some uh, vehicles that were parked near the shaft outside, burnt those up. 600 feet under the ground, Gary Martin and his crew didn't know what hit them. Uh, you couldn't see six inches in front of you. You couldn't get a good breath of clean air. Uh, my eyes were full of dust, and, and I just sat down because there was no use to try to run any place you couldn't see to work to run to. Within minutes of the explosion, Martin and his men had donned their self-rescuers and were walking away from the blocked exit toward the fresh air shaft, 3,000 feet away. Within 20 minutes after reaching the bottom of the new air shaft, five of the men in our crew took their self-rescuers out of their mouth. We had always been instructed never to remove your rescuer to your outside in, in a fresh atmosphere. Within 10 minutes after taking the rescuers out of their mouth, these five men passed out from carbon monoxide poisoning. Back in Farmington, word of the explosion reached Sarah Kosnowski. At this time, we still don't know what caused the explosion that occurred at approximately 5.40 this morning. And I turned it today show on NBC, and it told about that tragedy right there. Our best estimate is that at least 70 miners are still trapped inside the mine. Whew. I got that news, I ran out the street. And I didn't know anything for a while. I didn't even know my name because I, I just, it was so shocking. Shortly after 8 a.m., mine officials were told by an old miner living nearby that he had heard Gary Martin and his crew at the bottom of a vertical fresh air shaft 608 feet underground. In an effort to get fresh air to the men, massive fans that ventilate the mine were turned back on. A moment later, a second explosion tore through the mine. And of course, everybody took what cover there was to take because you're sitting in a round shaft bottom, there's not much place to hide. Danny Kuhn normally worked the midnight shift, but nine days earlier, he had injured both his legs while fighting a furniture store fire in downtown Farmington. If not for the fire, he would have been in number nine that night, near the spot of the explosion. Kuhn, who was trained in mine rescues, had made his way to the main portal of the mine, arriving just in time for another explosion. You could hear it rumbling underground long before it ever came out. Then when it came out, it came... the first one, I, they say, went roughly 1,500 feet in the air, the smoke and everything. The second one, probably, I'd say, maybe 500 feet. 
Through the chaos and smoke, Kuhn could make out signs of severe devastation. The men and Gary Martin's crew trapped in the bottom of the air shaft were supplied with new self-rescuers, and the five who had passed out were revived. A cement bucket, five feet wide and three feet deep, was carefully lowered down the air shaft to reach the eight men. And the first time they lowered the bucket down to us about 9.30 in the morning, the bucket uh, got within 25 foot of the shaft bottom and stopped. And uh, by telephone, I asked the state mine inspector at the top of the shaft, Mr. Ashcraft, I said, to John, we need 25 more feet and you'll be on the bottom. And he said, we're out of cable. Did it bring it back up, put more cable on it, then drop down again for the second time and they proceeded to bring those seven men out to the Martha's Run shaft. And they sent the bucket back down the third time. When we got in the bucket, it was about 10.40 a.m. And they hoisted the three of us to say that we were the last three out. When they reached the surface, the moment was captured by a newspaper photographer. The picture became a national icon, a symbol of miners' lives being snatched from the jaws of death. But for the families of 78 miners still trapped in the smoldering mine, the nightmare was just beginning. Your father-in-law is in there. Um, what sort of hope do you maintain for him coming out already? None. You don't think he will? No, sir. In the days following the 1968 mine explosion in Farmington, West Virginia, the families of the missing miners suffered along with the 78 men still trapped underground. There's a sign above the door at the Champion Store, press headquarters in Farmington, West Virginia, which reads, through these portals pass the finest coal miners in the world. Inside that store sits dozens of red-eyed, tired people, the families of some of these miners who are waiting patiently and hoping. They're waiting for any word from the smoldering mines where 78 miners have been trapped since Wednesday morning. And they're hoping against hope that the word will bring news that at least some of the men are safe. In the meantime, stoic courage seems to be the order of the day. Do you think your husband will come out alive? I'm hoping he will. I'm praying he will. And I'm, I'm sure he will. What are you doing as, as you wait? Praying. That's all I can do. Rescue operations are still impossible because of the density of the flames of the fire still burning at the Llewellyn portal. This mine is not going to be sealed I want to make it with our this mine is not going to be agreement, no agreement until every possible avenue has been explored to contact these men if they are alive to effect uh, a rescue or a recovery, whatever it might be. For 10 days, methane explosions continued to ignite from underground sparks. The mine's owner, Consolidated Coal, had no choice but to seal the mine. Sealing a mine is an effective method of putting out a fire and a sure sign that anyone trapped underground is believed dead. We must recognize that this is a hazardous operation, a hazardous business, and that what has occurred here is one of the hazards of being a miner. It's seen as a measure of last resort, especially for the families of those still underground. They called all of us in that little church up there at Lou Ellen. Boy, you talk about crying. Oh, it was, ter it was a terrible sight to see that night. It was terrible. Because we wanted to get the men out and we wanted to bury him and have a decent funeral. Over the next 10 years, the bodies of 59 miners were eventually pulled from the devastated mine. But 19 were never found. Today, at the National Mine Safety and Health Academy in Beckley, West Virginia, the lessons of mine disasters like the one at Farmington are played out. 
Rescue teams search for three missing miners trapped inside a mine choked with a thick cloud of black smoke from an unseen fire. Though this is only a drill, rehearsing for the inevitable tragedy, officials make the conditions inside the testing facility just like a mine fire. This is mandatory training that's being conducted today. The object is to prevent the disaster. The second part of it is we have people prepared to handle these disasters should they occur. It's important that we have people that can readily move to the area and uh, exercise a, a evacuation of the mine initially, and secondly, to find an uh, all unaccounted for persons. Same as when you were debriefed. All right, we got an LHD on fire. Bring up the fire extinguisher. Here it is. In this make-believe mine, rescue coordinators transfer information back to Command Central. Yeah, stop. Command wants you to hold on a minute. Everything the rescuers find is logged. CR is 1,200. CR is 1,200. NO2 is zero. NO2 is zero. H2S is three parts per million. Modern rescue teams can map a mine destroyed by fire. Well, they was going to go up uh, eight to seven, cross over and tie it in. Time is crucial in an exercise like this. In so many instances in the past, like the one at Farmington, miners died not from an explosion or fire, but from suffocation. We got bodies. We have one victim laying next to LSD with no vital signs. Thank you, Mark. I'll check him. Today, a memorial in Farmington stands on the spot where the bodies of the 19 missing miners are believed to be located. I could have been on there. My name could have been there. And it's an alphabetical order. It's not find, hard to find out where you'll be up there. The boy right above me was one of my best friends. And it's not, uh, not hard to place yourself on that monument, your name on that monument, they've been 79 people. The memorial was paid for with money raised by the Farmington widows. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. Many believe those who perished at Farmington did not die in vain. I'll proceed with the roll call. Arthur A. Anderson, Jr. A year after the disaster, Congress passed the first comprehensive coal mine health and safety act. The law was passed in part because of the lobbying efforts made by the family members of those who died at Farmington. It changed the way we mine coal, not simply in Marion County, but the way we mine coal throughout every state in the nation. And it provided for safer mines in this nation for the first time in this its nation's history. So I always say these miners didn't just die in 1968. They, they, they were heroes. Because without them dying, without this explosion that occurred where the nation had to watch it, we would have had literally thousands and thousands of more deaths in the nation's mines. In the 30 years since the Farmington tragedy, 16,000 fewer miners have died in accidents than in the 30 years prior. More government regulation and stricter enforcement of the laws have made mining safer. But every year, dozens of miners still die on the job, while hundreds more succumb to black lung-related diseases. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that's... At the Farmington Memorial, the human cost of the tragedy plays out on the anniversary of the disaster every year. For those mining today, it is impossible to ignore the sacrifices of those who have gone before them. No one has given more to this country 
to energize this country and make this country great. No one has sacrificed as much as coal miners. It's a legacy that's etched in the face of every person who has done the work that few have the courage to do, the job of a miner.